Mr. Jeremy Jones AM. He is going, his topic today is Dialogue of the Heart and Dialogue, Dialogue of Action in the Jewish Tradition. Jeremy Jones is a founder and co-chair of the Australian National Dialogue of Christians, Muslims and Jews, life member and former president of the Executive Council of Australian Jewry. He has participated in dialogues, conferences, and lecture tours in 30 countries, been on eight Australian government delegations to human rights, human rights meeting, and has been published or interviewed by many prestigious international media outlets. He is a member of the Order of Australia, the winner of the 2007 Australian Human Rights Medal, and of the 2004 FECCA Medal for Contribution to multiculturalism. Give a warm welcome to Mr. Jeremy Jones. The, the first thing I would like to do is to everybody here express my apologies for anything I may have done, consciously or unconsciously, which has brought any discomfort, upset <coughs> or hurt to you. I'm doing this not only because I have the opportunity, but because in the Jewish uh, religion at the moment, we are in the first 10 days of the month of Tishrei, the time between Rosh Hashanah, our New Year, and Yom Kippur, the holiest day. And it's a tradition now, and we are trying to repent, be sorry, think about how we can be better human beings, not only to do it in a way which is in communication with God, but also communication with other human beings. So I hope you can accept anything I have done wrong, I certainly hope you will understand it's something I will try and remove from my personality and my actions in the years to come. In terms of my topic today, I just have to explain something. When I was asked for the topic, I've had a very hectic period recently. And it was during the course of what I was doing that the topic came to me as something relevant. And maybe I will focus on it, maybe not, but I just want to explain. During the end of July and August, I was in, in Indonesia. I was in Indonesia speaking to Islamic institutions, and generally, if the audience was 50 or 800, there had been one or two people at the most who had ever met a Jewish person in the audience. So I was asked many questions. There was a great deal of interest. It was very warm and very positive. But what I found most interesting is when we were able to talk about not only what we think, but what we actually do. What dialogue is beyond an intellectual or philosophical idea. I was then in, G in Germany at a most remarkable conference called the Muslim Jewish Conference. There were roughly 150 young people, Jews and Muslims, from nearly 50 countries. Many of them were taking a brave action by being at the conference. Some of them in their environment has been dangerous to talk about dialogue or engagement or a positive relationship with people of any other faith, regardless of what it was. But the people were together, working not only to learn from each other. There were only really two question and answer sessions. Myself and an imam from Canada took the question and answers to the religion. Most of the time were people in workshops, commissions, addressing serious issues of international concern and concern to both. Now these could be how you can help people learn about arts and culture, or issues of gender and religion, or anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. But people dialoguing, finding the opportunity when you're together for one full week of not just talking about ideas, but thinking how you can act on those ideas. <coughs> I was in Poland, which is quite remarkable at the moment, because as many of you will know, virtually every Jewish person who was living in Poland prior to the Second World War was a victim of the Nazi genocide. Most were murdered, some were able to escape, but basically from a very large Jewish population to almost no Jewish population. But what we're now seeing in Poland is many non-Jewish people saying, we need to know about the relationship between the Polish people, the Catholic Polish people largely, and the Jewish people. We need to learn. And there are amazing institutions. There's an enormous amount of goodwill being done. Too late, obviously, to save lives. Too late to replace something. But have people recognising that each of us is not only the product of our own birth and our own life, but also of the relations we have had as
as individuals and communities with other people. But then I was in China, but my Chinese experience was not a typical experience. I didn't hang around in Beijing. I didn't go and see the wall. I didn't go to many of the institutions, many of the great cultural institutions. I saw a little bit, but not much. Mainly, I was in Western China, in the Uyghur area, the largely Muslim area, where I was experiencing with the Muslim people in that area the remarkable way they have maintained religion and faith and identity despite enormous pressure to give up anything to do with religion and anything to do with belief and anything to do with God. And it was a really quite interesting time and gave me some really interesting insights. But it also reaffirmed to me again the message. And that is, when people talk about Abraham, and they talk about God, and they talk about dialogue, it's a huge difference between ideas and action, and you need both. We heard a wonderful presentation from Rabbi Roberts before, who really did an excellent summary in my mind of the main features of Abraham, not only in the Torah, but more importantly, in a sense, about how Jewish people incorporate messages and stories from Abraham in our daily lives. The most important story for many of us, and certainly I know in the context of people in this gathering, was Abraham sitting in the heat of the day at his tent. In Jewish tradition, every flat was open so people from any direction could come. Shortly after an operation from which he would be recuperating in some pain, rushing out to welcome people into the tent. Now, there's many interesting features of this story, but one lovely story that I've heard from a, a, a great Hasidic rabbi was that the three men, three men were angels. Two of these angels later went on and had an encounter with Abraham's nephew, Lot. But Abraham didn't need to be told they were angels because Abraham saw the angel in every human being. And if there's a message in there, in terms of dialogue and relations with each other, it's our injunction, if we want to follow the teaching of Abraham, to see the angel inside of everybody. And it's also interesting, again, if you look at the structure of the Torah, the Jewish, the Jewish Bible, you look at the structure, much of it is a story of the Jewish people, of Abraham and his descendants for many, many generations how the people lived, what they did. But that's not the starting point. The starting point is with the universal. The starting point is with everybody. First, there's a relationship between God and the world and everyone. Later, there's a specific relationship with Abraham and the people who followed monotheistic religions as brought by Abraham, because we say Abraham was not the first monotheist, he didn't invent the idea, but he is the person who we respect as the great teacher, the leader, the person who took that idea and brought it to a large chunk of humanity. Now, this, now, when we think about this, most of us, when we talk about our relations with other people, first our relationship is with our parents and our family, then maybe with our local neighbourhood or our community, then our nation, then with everybody else. But in the, in the Jewish Bible, the first relationship is with everybody. Only later is this the specific relationship within your family, within your people. Which, to my mind, teaches us that both relationships exist, both are important, and if you don't have one, you, you, you really don't have the fullness of the possibilities and potential of the other. And that was a very important teaching, which relates directly to where we come across Abraham. So, as uh, Rabbi Roberts mentioned, at this time of the year, in the synagogues, in our holy days, we talk about Abraham. He is a figure who is part of our Torah readings, our readings from our holy books at this time. Now, my rabbi came up with an interesting point on the first day of the Jewish New Year in his presentation, where he said, for him, what did we know about Abraham? Well, Abraham came along where there was a world thinking about what problems there were, what concerns. You have a problem, you have an idol, you pray to that idol. It's a world of problems. Abraham is a person who's not so interested in the problems as the answers. And if he's not satisfied with an answer, he's going to look for another answer. So you have a world obsessed with problems and somebody talking about answers. And it's more than that, though, because this is somebody who then goes to a place he's never been, moves his family on a mission, 
So it's not simply looking for an answer, but it's a willing, willingness to try and bring about the answer that he sees for all of humanity. He was a man with a mission. Well, actually a family with a mission. Abraham didn't do anything by himself. He was part of a family with a mission. And what was that mission? The mission was to bring to the world God's world. To bring a very different sort of world to the planet than there had been previously. And he, took, he did amazing things to do this. Now when you think about it again, particularly in the time of Abraham, we had heroes and epics and many other philosophers. Some of them were military figures. Some were gurus with millions of followers. Abraham was none of these. Abraham was a person with an idea and a belief and a commitment and a vision. And Abraham, we could say, has arguably, and I think it's a very strong argument, been the most influential person in history. When you look at the number of people who've been influenced by the mission of Abraham of Hebrew. So here you have this person with a mission. You, here you have somebody with a mission, a belief, and a vision. And, and this is also somebody who, when he looks at other human beings, he sees the angel. And he also has a great, um, he, he's, an, he's an archetype of faith, and an archetype of hospitality. You can find all this, and what does this teach us? What should we be thinking about with this inspirational model? And my argument is that one of the things we need to think about is our relation with other people through dialogue and through real meaningful relationships which are not based on looking at the outside of a person but looking into that person and also appreciating every human being is made in the image of God. Now it's a sad reality. In much of history, in many places, people who have put themselves forward as the believers or the faithful have been very negative towards people with different visions and different faiths. Sometimes it has been uh, almost patronising, you know, if only these people were allowed to have the great insight I have, they would be like me. Other times it's, we must crush these people because they stand for something very bad and evil. And rather than trying to understand what is motivating somebody in a positive way, it's seeing what is wrong, what is the label. Let's talk about them rather than talk with them. Yet here we are today, taking advantage of the unique Australian society, where people can talk with each other rather than simply about each other. And I would think we are squandering the message of Abraham if we don't take the opportunity to try to talk with people rather than about them. But talking is only part of the picture. We do a lot of talking in Australia. It's very easy to talk. It's very easy to have ideas. There are many great functions. You have an opportunity in Australia and internationally now with particularly in online media or whatever, anybody can learn anything they want to. But that's not the same as working with somebody. And it's not the same as having a vision which is inclusive. A vision that says, we want to build a better world, but we can't do it by ourselves, or even if we did, who says we've got the best wisdom? Who says we've got the best ideas? Taking advantage of others and saying, let's work with them. We can look in Australian examples, for instance, Many of us now mark the Reconciliation Week between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. That began as the week of prayer for Aboriginal reconciliation. First was the week of prayer. It came about by meetings of representatives, firstly of the churches in Australia, and I was invited as the only non-Christian the government apparently had heard of 20 years ago. Now I think it spread well beyond that. At the second meeting, we also had Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Sikh, Indigenous faith. We had a much larger representation. But we had people working <coughs> together to say we need to learn, but we need to act. And there were some groups, particularly, uh, I'm not sure if they're even representatives today, so I can mention them complimentarily anyway. The United Church, for example, took really firm action to work out how it could improve that relationship. There have been issues to do with refugee work, where people have been working together. Many other issues within society where people have said, we want a better planet, so we have to work together to achieve that. And this is what I've seen as a real possibility and potential in our society today. We have the opportunity to work together to say, what projects do we want to do? How can we follow the vision of Abraham and do this? 
Now, Ra Ra uh, Rabbi Sachs, the former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, of the United Synagogues of the United Kingdom, is not a chief rabbi if you're not part of the United Synagogues, but that's a technical problem that we tend to ignore when we're quoting a great man like Rabbi Sachs. But Rabbi Sachs uh, often said, what was the difference between Abraham and others? Because he wasn't the first, well, not the first. But he was somebody who had a view, not only of the world, not only of faith, not only of God, but also the search for a promised land, a journey to a promised land, but a vision of a world which would be a lot better. So it simply is not the matter of belief. It's a matter of working towards the sort of world you need to see. That is the only way you can be faithful to the tradition of Abraham. And I know it's very difficult to ask uh, forgiveness, and at the time uh, Mr. Jones did ask forgiveness, and from all of us we do forgive you. And at the same time, at the same time we seek your forgiveness as well. Uh, 